Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. If you would, please open a Bible to both Exodus 19 and Romans 5. And alas, as I was listening to the reading, uh, Romans reading, I, I realized I didn't even get to verse 6 in this, which is just like, I mean, that's a sermon for another time, just that one verse alone. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Good stuff. Anyway, if you're uh, searching around in your Bible, <clears throat> Exodus is the second book, so really near the beginning, and Romans is towards the very end, maybe about an eighth of an inch from the back, depending upon your print size. <clears throat> and remember, as somebody last week put it to me, the table of contents is your friend. Now, as I am eager to get to St. Paul's Yoda moment, suffering leads to endurance, endurance leads to character, character <laughs> leads to hope, right? As I'm eager to get there, nevertheless, let's start with our reading from Exodus 19. Because on its own, in a vacuum, as it were, our reading from Exodus 19 could possibly be misleading, it could lead one to wildly optimistic conclusions about the capacity of the human heart to be faithful and obedient to God on our own. So let's look at it. Exodus 19, verse 1, we are told that Israel is three months out from the big mic drop moment of the Exodus. That moment when God, when God with a mighty miraculous hand, delivered Israel out of slavery in Egypt by parting the waters of the Red Sea, enabling Israel to pass through those waters and then bringing those same waters crashing down upon all the chariots and horses of Pharaoh, utterly destroying them. And now, <coughs> three months later, God has led Israel to the foot of Mount Sinai, and God intends to make a covenant with them there. Look at the language of verse 5. God tells Moses to tell Israel, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Now, we'll get to that tricky if language in a moment. But for the moment, let's stick with what the Lord is saying about the relationship he is proposing to have with his people. You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. In other words, he is stating that he plans here to fulfill the final part of an intention that he declared back to Moses all the way back in Exodus 6, before all the plagues, before all the miracles, when he said, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an, out, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. At this point now, he's done everything but in that list. Bring Israel out from under the burden of the Egyptians? Check. Deliver them from slavery? Check. Redeem them with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. Yes, indeed, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and so now it's time for the last part, to make a covenant with them, wherein they will be his people and he will be their God. And if that sounds almost like God's marrying Israel, well, yeah, that's exactly what's in view. You are looking at the eve before a wedding here. God, the hero, the knight in shining armor, has come to the rescue of the fair, maimed, the damsel, and the distressed Israel. And having rescued her, he's going to take her hand in marriage, and they will, or so the story is supposed to go, they will live happily ever after. So what you're seeing in Exodus 19 is, in a sense, a marriage proposal. And Moses, like a good squire, is conveying this marriage proposal from his Lord to the people, from the valiant knight to the rescued lady. The Lord asks, will you marry me, O Israel? And the people reply, verse 8, I do, right? Verse 8, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. But the big thing is, that is not a simple I do, right? The people here not only accept the proposal, they enthusiastically accept the conditions of the proposal, that big, fat, if statement that the Lord led with. And there, in a seemingly happily ever after moment, there, this morning, ended the lesson for us. Just like any romantic comedy worth its salt, our reading cuts off at that point, before the actual hard stuff, 
before reality sets in, before you actually need to start doing marriage, right? And we see what really happens to any oh-so-happy couple five, six, seven years down the road after the thrill and the hormones have worn off, replaced by too many bills and too many diapers. But the sad thing is, in Israel's case, we're not talking years before the honeymoon's over. We're talking weeks, just about a month, actually, before Israel's cheating heart starts fashioning for herself a new boyfriend in the shape of a golden calf up ahead in Exodus 34. I mean, I got to confess, a cow made of gold wouldn't have been my first adulterous thought, right? <laughs> Maybe a golden iPhone 15, which sh- with shrines therein for YouTube and Amazon Prime. But hey, you know, to each his own. But here's the thing. Think about the sense you're left with if we end the reading where we did, if we don't know about the rest, or if we put Israel's coming infidelity out of sight, out of sight and out of mind, as we're very wont to do. You know, focus on the positive. Well read in a vacuum, I think it's very tempting to see here, to imagine here, an insanely rosy picture of the potential, the capacity for faithfulness and obedience on the part of Israel and the part of God's people. And therefore, on the part of, well, us, Right? In other words, it's very easy, very natural even, to try to twist what's going on here into a model for us to imitate and to emulate. And many churches out there do that. Maybe not with this passage, because nobody but us reads the Old Testament anymore. But, you know, in general, are you struggling with your walk with the Lord? Well, you need to want it more. You need to believe it more. You need to be more all in. You just got to be like Israel here in her 100% committed all in response. All these things we will do. Say it with me now. Oh, and give generously because my jet needs an interior makeover. It's so 2015. (laughs) Now, here's the thing. In one sense, sure, this story is a model for us. We should have this kind of enthusiasm for loving and obeying the Lord. Would that we all had this kind of infectious can-do spirit when it comes to loving and serving the Lord. And sometimes, even, we do. And yet, while it is indeed a story to imitate, it's just not the whole story. Because the whole story is about how our enthusiasm to be faithful is not the same thing at the end of the day to actually being faithful. How our desire to obey God is not enough to make us obey God. Now and then, here and there, sure, but perfectly, over the long haul, until death do we part, to bring back that marriage analogy. And in fact, that marriage analogy is pretty good. And God's probably raising an eyebrow right now. Of course, it's a good analogy, Len. It's my analogy. But but let's leave that. On a couple's wedding day, presumably, that man and that woman want the very best for their marriage and for each other. Husband and wife say those vows, and they mean every single word, enthusiastically, all these things we will do. And yet, what is the statistic? Something like 50% of marriages end in divorce, and plenty more might not go there, but they might as well be there. And even those that remain strong decades later, well, there may still be some enthusiasm there. I mean, hopefully, right? But there's also a whole lot of forgiveness for all the ways that that other person has fallen short. The late Tim Keller, very unromantically, saw two things holding together marriages, keeping them together. One, covenant. That marriage promise you made that you would never leave that other person. And two, forgiveness. For all the ways in which you have broken your promises and each other's hearts down through the years. And it's like that with God's people and God. Our enthusiasm to obey is not enough. And sometimes we don't even have that. And so if you think Israel's enthusiasm is primarily a model to imitate, to compare yourself to, to measure yourself against, or to compare others to, well, when you do crash and burn, and you will, just like Israel eventually, you are either going to be crushed by the failure or transformed into a Pharisee with all your legal loopholes and all manner of excuses to convince yourself that you haven't actually failed. Right? My arm, your, your arm's off. No, it isn't. Right? so as to free yourself up for the really important business of judging everybody else. On the other hand, if you do know Israel's story, well, this moment, this super optimistic, enthusiastic, we can do it moment, is a moment that is either tragically sad or wildly, darkly humorous, depending upon how twisted of a person you are. I have a deep fondness for schadenfreude, so I think it's all stinking hilarious. 
Israel's blissful can-do optimism here seems on par to me with, I don't know, the idea of me trash-talking Mike Tyson before getting in the ring with him, right? What comes next is going to be hilarious, just not for me, right? <laughs> but the thing is, you and I have an advantage in knowing the what comes next for Israel, the tragic history that's coming down the road, and in seeing that tragic history of faithlessness and disobedience as a kind of invisible, unstated, dark shadow looming over this moment of optimism in Exodus 19. And here's the weird thing. That advantage that we have is actually even more important than the advantage that this generation of God's people in Exodus 19 seem to have. Look at verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. This generation of all the generations of Israel has actually seen the mighty acts of God with their own two eyes. They've seen these incredible things and logically, one would think, having seen such things, it would be easy to be faithful, easy to be obedient. Right? Even the Lord's language that begins verse 5 implies that. Note those first two words. Now, therefore, right? Now, therefore, O Israel, since you have seen some wild, crazy God stuff happen and know clearly I've got this kind of mojo and I'm on your side, just trust me. Just do what I tell you to do. How hard is that going to be now? And yet, if we were to keep reading past Exodus and the golden calf in Exodus 34, on the other side of Leviticus, into the book of Numbers, we would see that this generation that had seen the mighty acts of God becomes the paradigm, the model in scripture for what an unfaithful generation looks like. Because of the repeated disobediences, they are not allowed to enter the promised land and are made to wander until they eventually die off towards the end of the book of Numbers. The generation that, by all human logic, should be a model of faithfulness and obedience is actually Quite the opposite. It's like what Jesus says to Thomas, who just had to see for himself that Jesus was resurrected. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's a powerful word to every generation of God's people. Because the shadow looming over the optimism of Exodus 19 is that not even this generation who had seen it all could remain faithful to their redeeming God. It hasn't happened in a while, presumably because you were all so much more wise in the ways of the Lord, right? But I can recall there was this point in time where people were, for some reason, always saying to me with this kind of weird, kind of romantic dreaminess, oh, if only I could have met Jesus back then, if only I could have seen him with my own two eyes, then this would all be so much easier. And scriptures reply to that, and not just in this the pessimistic subtext of our reading from Exodus 19, Scripture's reply to that is that that's a load of baller dash, right? That wildly underestimates the fickleness and unfaithfulness of the human heart. And more than that, it locates what is necessary for you to be made faithful, to be made obedient once again in you, right? With something about you, as if, if you only had this or that thing, this or that intense feeling, then, then you could finally be faithful, but that's the underlying point of Exodus 19. The faithfulness and obedience of God's people is never and was never going to be found in what they had seen inspiring them or in their enthusiasm driving them or ultimately in their doing any, let alone all of those things. Now let's pause there and turn to Romans 5 because what we've essentially done in reading what Israel in Exodus 19 says in light of what Israel in Exodus 19 actually eventually goes on to do what we've ultimately done is summarize Paul's main point in what leads up in Romans to our reading, Paul's main points in Romans 1 to 3. Namely, how everybody, because of a categorical human inability to be faithful and obedient, is justly under the wrath of God. And nobody's exempt from this. Neither Jew nor Gentile, not even Steelers fans, I'm sorry to say. Whether you know God's law or you don't, doesn't matter because it's all just so plainly obvious what's right and what's wrong, what's just and what's unjust. And the sad conclusion that Paul reaches in Romans 3, quoting from the Psalms, is that no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they become worthless. No one does good, no, not even one. 
It is a categorical dismissal of anything like that. All these things we will do, optimism from Exodus 19. A categorical dismissal of any possibility, of any capacity of human beings in their fallen and broken state of being good, of choosing good, of choosing God over ourselves and our whims, of doing the things necessary to become, to use Paul's term here, to become righteous. That is to become worthy of being in that intended relationship, in that marriage of God and God's people. However, our reading, Romans 5, declares that a new reality now stands over that shadow of all our faithless, faith, faithlessness and sin. A new reality about us that has simply entirely removed our faithfulness and our obedience, the need for those things from the equation. Notice our reading begins, Romans 5.1, with an important little word, therefore. That means that to understand what Romans 5 is saying, we got to back up to see what Paul has just said in Romans 4, where Paul has been talking about the faith of Abraham. That is, Abraham's just trusting in God, and that faith in God being, quote, counted to him as righteousness. That is, that trusting and hoping in God is somehow enough for that right standing before God. So look immediately before our reading, Romans 4, 23 and following. But the words, it, faith, was counted to him, Abraham, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believed in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. In short, our faith in God is also counted as our righteousness. But not just God generally, not just the God of your fanciful imagination, not just the God of beautiful sunsets and cute puppy dogs, as lovely as cute puppy dogs are, right? but rather specifically faith in and trust in the God who is the one who, verse 24, raised Jesus from the dead. And specifically this Jesus who was, who was one, delivered up for our trespasses, our sins or offenses, and two, raised from the dead for our justification. That is for our righteous standing before this same God for that unearned, by you at least, righteousness that merely having faith in this God achieves. You put your faith in that God, the God of the cross, and what God did in Jesus for you on that cross becomes all the right standing you will ever need. Now notice some details here. It's not faith in your faith, as if believing more strongly equals more righteousness. It's not faith in what all this means for you. Our faith isn't in our going to heaven, or whatever eternal life looks like for you. It's not even faith so much in exactly how all this works, the mechanic of your salvation, as it were, as if faith is about a firm understanding of a very specific and detailed outline of dogma and doctrine. I mean, don't get me wrong, good doctrine is important, but most often it's important for our comfort and for assurance more than anything else. No, instead, what is in view is your faith in God, in him, and who he is for you seen in Jesus Christ and the cross, Period, full stop. And that has two profound implications in this life now, in your walk with the Lord now. And they are even better than all the enthusiasm and optimism and can-do spirit that we saw in Exodus 19. And the first of these is peace. So beginning with that therefore statement in Romans 5, 1, Paul says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, made righteous as an effect of our faith in God, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if Exodus 19 imagines that the relationship between God and God's people as ideally like a marriage, and Paul in Romans 1 through 3 has demonstrated that the ability, that that relationship is now in reality in open rebellion, then as in any marriage, in such a case, the necessary precondition is for some kind of reconciliation, peace. But Paul's point here is even more existentially pointed because his argument in Romans 1 through 3 was that we are all in our open rebellion deserving of the wrath of God. And so peace here is foremost about simply not being under that wrath anymore. Look, skim ahead to verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. In other words, just trusting in that completely unearned righteousness of faith Trusting in God means that the wrath of God goes away, poof, gone, because you and God are all good. You're at peace with him, complete peace with God. But the thing is, I'm not sure that that actually existentially hits home for most people today, the idea of peace as just the removal of wrath. 
because basically, moderns don't like to hear any talk about the wrath of God and that kind of thing. I mean, now we're all a little crazy here at All Saints because we love talking about the wrath of God because we understand that the better you grasp the wrath of God, the better we can grasp how amazing is the God and Savior who saved us from it. But most people today simply find it unpleasant, to say the least, off-putting, right? It's medieval, it's backwards, and we've moved beyond such superstitions and ideas about God, and so nobody these days tends to believe in that kind of thing. And even if somebody does, it's functionally, probably, quite far removed from your thoughts. But a couple of things. One, wrath is like that marriage analogy. It's like saying father or son. It's a human word describing a human emotion that is actually an imperfect attempt to get at the idea that a holy God and an unholy sinner might just combust a little to the detriment of the sinner if they come into contact. Two, in some ways, grasping real peace with God might actually be harder than grasping that wrath of God because you might be able to ignore this whole wrath thing But if you even have an inkling that there's something beyond you, that there's something even like God, as it were, even your conscience, your self-image, as this lord over your own self-worth, it's not a bad bet that you wonder, frequently or infrequently, where the two of you stand, that you fret, that you and the Almighty, whoever that is for you, might have a thing or two to work out, that the jury might still be out on you and your moral scorecard, as it were. I mean, what percentage of the endless chattering that goes on inside your head is dedicated to rationalizing something you've done, or you're going to do, you didn't do, you should have done, or shouldn't have done? Just figuring out or just trying to convince yourself that you're a good person in this situation, or a better person than somebody else, or why you're not really all that bad for this, or why what you're doing is okay, or what you're doing, or what you're gonna do to make up for what you're doing. Everybody, everybody has this little courtroom in their head, even the most rabid atheists. But if you are trusting in God, again, in that God who raised that Jesus from that cross and took away your sins, you now have peace with that God. And that means that the gavel has been struck for you. The judge and the jury have gone home and there's nothing more to argue. There's nothing more to prove. And when you find yourself still trying to make the case for yourself, whether to yourself or to somebody else, or heaven forbid, to God, you're not just declaring that God's declaration of peace is insufficient. More sinfully, you're declaring what bought you that peace, what earned you your righteousness is insufficient, namely the shed blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. And I know, I know, in the moments when you are most tempted to plead your case in your head or even out loud, looking for validation for yourself somehow, trying to prove to yourself that you really are a good person. These are often the moments when you feel, when you feel desperately insufficient. These are the moments when you feel, are filled with doubt, with insecurity, where you feel fragile and fearful. But remember, even if this doesn't feel like the same thing, what we are talking about in such trying to continue our pleadings and courtroom arguments. What we're still talking about is humanity's same old word of doubt from the garden. Did God really say? Did he really say peace? And if he did, did he really mean it? It's always the old Adam rearing his ugly head. It will always be so much easier to say, all these things we will do, and to work out how to rationalize our failure later, than to say, and truly believe it's all you will ever need, Thank you, Jesus. But when we can, when we can, then we have the second thing that comes of that righteousness through faith, hope. We have true hope. Let's look at verse two. Through him, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Think about what's being said here. This faith, this trust, in the God who raised Jesus Christ. And therefore, this trust through Jesus has given us access to, it gets you into a place of grace, a place of unearned standing where you can rejoice in hope, in the joyous expectation of sharing in the glory of God. The little matter of your complete open rebellion, gone, forgotten, never heard of it. And that promised marriage, the wedding that was called off on account of it, it's back on, baby. And that means in this life, 
the grace in which you stand now is as his betrothed. And that is not your goal. That is not something that you are working towards. That is your achieved and completely unearned hope. Israel's hope in Exodus 19 was founded on a big, terrible if. The if of their own ability to choose the right thing, to do the right thing, and to keep doing it. But your hope is founded on the bigger and more wonderful cross of Jesus Christ, which has secured for you that peace and given you a secure hope precisely by removing you completely from what wins you your betrothal. God in Christ has simply won you and it instead. And knowing that, having that faith in him, and knowing that, and have, having faith that in him is all your righteousness and all your hope, that transforms your life entirely. Because your life is now no longer about earning that good standing, that good place. It's about knowing you already stand in that good place. And that your life is now about God making you more ready, more able to stand completely and fully in that place. Look at verses 3 and following, the Yoda verses finally. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Secure in who we are, in Christ, before God, our lives are no longer about proving anything to ourselves or to others and least of all to God, but rather about being shaped, being forged, being transformed in the good things and the bad into becoming who we are meant to be and who we are already, the betrothed of the Lord, his beloved, who can trust him in all things like a bride should trust her groom. In the good times and the bad, in the rich times and the poor, in sickness and in health, until death do we return to him to be perfected in all his glory. And finally, this suffering, this endurance, this character forming. The word there in Greek has the sense of testing the pureness of a precious metal. All this, it is not a thing for you to do. As in yet another, all these things we will do to satisfy the impossible demands of a big fat if over your life. It is rather, in such moments, the unconscious response of simply knowing who you are, of knowing that you are loved and by the only one who truly matters because Verse 5 again, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so to him, and certainly not to us, be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.